so amazing to be here. I've not been back in this building for over a year. And it is just incredible to see all these friendly faces, these people that I've missed. It's really, really great. And for those of you that are at home, that's normally where I am. I'm normally online engaging with church. It's great to be with you too. I always feel like I'm with you even when I'm not. One of the things I wonder when I'm at home is, is everyone following the rules? Is it safe to go back into the building? And I'm pleased to say that I'm looking around and everyone's wearing their masks, people are socially distanced, the rules are being followed. Although, man, I've got to say, it's really tough to follow the rule about not singing. Like Rajiv said, it is so difficult. I found myself mouthing silently, like, oh, I've got to join in a little bit. That was a tough rule. I think that the pandemic has taught us some interesting things about rules. I bet, for most of us, this is the most rules we've ever had to live with, the most restrictions on what we can and can't do. We're not used to it, are we? And people have responded differently to the rules. I've discovered that I love rules, which has really surprised me. I wouldn't have thought I was that kind of person. But I really love rules. I love filling the rules and feeling pleased with myself. Like, aren't I a good girl? I've done everything I've been asked to. And in a way, that's a good thing. I've done my best to keep my family safe. I've done my best to honor what the government have asked of us. But I've also noticed some less attractive elements uh, of my character coming out as I've followed those rules. I've discovered that I get a little bit proud, if I'm honest. I start to be a bit self-congratulatory. I start to feel a bit self-righteous and judge the people that are not following the rules. I find myself tutting when someone jogs past me too closely or I'm in a shop and people don't keep a social distance. Rules have a funny effect on me. You might be different. You might be someone that didn't follow the rules, that hasn't followed the rules. Maybe you've just thought, gosh, they're so frustrating. I don't see the point of it. I don't even agree with these rules. And so you've just thought, no, I'm not keeping them. Some people respond that way to rules. And some of us might be somewhere in the middle. You want to keep the rules. You kind of understand why we've got to do things like not hug other people or not have our friends in our house. But that's no fun, is it? So we find that we struggle to keep the rules, even if we mean to. And it's good to know that this has always been the case with humans. From the beginning of time, we have struggled with rules. And that's what I want to talk about today. The difference between living with your heart focused on rules versus living with your heart filled with the Spirit of God. In the Old Testament, in, in the beginning of the Bible, you see that there are hundreds and hundreds of rules that people had to follow. Lots of those rules that we don't follow anymore. Things like having to eat, not having to eat pork, you weren't allowed to eat pork, those kind of things. We don't have to follow them anymore because we live in the new covenant. So the old covenant, the old agreement was that we lived to all of these rules. And in the new agreement, the new covenant, we don't have to do all of that anymore. As Sean so wonderfully said during the worship, Jesus was that perfect lamb and sacrifice who shed his blood for us so that we didn't have to keep making the animal sacrifices that they used to have to make in order to approach God and to be acceptable before him. I don't know about you, but I'm a bit of an animal lover, so the thought of an animal sacrifice makes me feel really, really uncomfortable. I'm like, oh, poor lamb, I can't believe they did that. Why would God ask them to do that? But the point of it is, sin is serious. It's so serious that there has to be a price paid. There has to be a cost to sin. Our God is a just God. He wants justice. And if we go around doing bad things and there's never a consequence, there's never a cost, there's never a price to pay, then how is that justice? So the price that has to be paid is the shedding of blood. And thankfully, we don't have to sacrifice little lambs anymore because Jesus lived that perfect life and was sacrificed and did shed his blood so that all of our sin is covered for all time. And it's incredible because it means we don't have to meet all the standards anymore. We don't have to fulfill every rule in order to be acceptable to God. He's not looking at what we do. He's looking at what Jesus has done. And that is so freeing. It is so, so freeing. 
That's the grace of God in our lives. So does that mean then that we can do whatever we want, that we can just go on living uh, in immoral ways, that we can do bad things and not worry about it because we're covered by what Jesus did. Jesus has paid the price for it, so I can do what I want. By no means. We're gonna read Hebrews 8 where it says, this is the covenant that I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Notice he doesn't say, I'm gonna chuck the law away. It doesn't matter anymore. You can do what you like. He says he's gonna write it on our hearts. And actually, this wasn't God just changing his mind about the rules. He always intended this. In the Old Testament, in Jeremiah 31, we read almost exactly the same thing. He tells us he's going to do this. He says, behold, the days are coming. And then he goes on to say, I will put my law in their minds and inscribe it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. So he's telling us, this isn't always going to be about loads of written rules. I'm gonna put it in your hearts and I'm gonna ask you to live differently. Back then, people struggled to keep the rules, just like we struggle now. But God has never really been interested in rules for rules' sake. All throughout scripture, you see that even though there are rules, he's always talking about the heart. I'm gonna just read out a few quick scriptures to you to just give you a sense of the theme and the consistent flow of that. Back in the Old Testament in Hosea, he says, I desire steadfast love, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. In the Psalms, he says, you will not delight in sacrifice. Sorry, God isn't saying that. David is saying that. You will not delight in sacrifice or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. He's talking about the heart. In Proverbs, it says to do righteousness and justice is more acceptable to the Lord than sacrifice. In the New Testament, in Mark, he says, love God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. He's always been after our hearts. Russ spoke last week about how God pours out his love into our hearts. He fills us with his spirit and enables us to live differently. He's always wanted us to have a spirit-filled heart not a rule-filled heart. Now, that sounds good, in, but what does it look like in practice? I want to share with you an example from my own life of how I've experienced this spirit-filled heart. When I was younger as a Christian, I used to really, really want to keep the rules, which wouldn't surprise you. I've kind of always been like that. And I thought it was because I really loved God and I wanted to be a good Christian. And Part of it was that, but part of it was also that I wanted to feel good about myself and I wanted to earn God's approval. So I tried really hard to keep the rules and to be the best Christian I could possibly be. And surprise, surprise, I sometimes failed. I couldn't keep all the rules all the time, as hard as I tried. And so I got really discouraged. I started to feel like, oh, what's the point in trying? I am never going to meet the standard of perfection. I'm never going to meet God's standards. And so I gave up for a season. I stopped coming to church. I stopped trying to live for God. I just found myself thinking, I can't do this. Fast forward a couple of years of basically me just living in sin, living in ways that I knew weren't honoring to God. I decided, actually, I really miss God. And I, regardless, I just want to go back to him. My heart was just crying out for him. And as I went back to God, as I made this decision that I was going to live for him again, something pretty weird happened. God blessed me massively, abundantly, a miraculous provision. It's a story for another time, but it was incredible. And I was really confused because I hadn't actually stopped sinning yet. And I remember saying to God, what are you doing? (laughs) Why are you being so nice to me? I'm not being good yet. I don't understand why you're being so nice to me. And God spoke to me through someone else and said, I'm being nice to you, I'm blessing you when you're most aware you don't deserve it because I want you to understand it was never about that. It's just because I love you. And that blew my mind. It changed the way that I lived because I didn't have to work hard to be acceptable. He loved me anyway, regardless of how I behaved. I had never understood that before. How that changed my heart was that the next time I encountered a sin that tempted me, I'm sorry to say I didn't turn away from it straight away. I was tempted, 
I went into that situation. And in the midst of that situation, I discovered I had a new conscience. And it wasn't a conscience that said, oh, you must follow the rules or you're going to be in trouble. You're not going to be a good Christian. It wasn't that kind of conscience. The conscience was, oh, I don't want to be this person anymore. This is not who I am. I want to live for God. I want what he wants. The spirit had changed my heart. And suddenly my heart wanted what God's heart wanted. My desires changed and my conscience changed. That's what it means to live with a spirit-filled heart. And suddenly it became much easier to follow the rules. I was a lot less tempted after that because I wasn't trying to earn anything. I wasn't trying to be acceptable before God. I just wanted what he wanted because he loved me and because I love him so much. It can sound easy in theory to know that we're acceptable before God because of what he's done. If you've been a Christian for a long time, you probably think, yeah, I know that. I've heard it. I probably hear it every week in some form. But the trouble is, even though we know it, we find it really tempting to go back into living for the rules. We find them really, really appealing. I think it's for a couple of reasons. I think, firstly, it's because it's how our society is, isn't it? We are used to having to work hard for what we get. We're used to having to earn things. We're also used to people judging us on how things look outwardly rather than what's going on in our heart. And I think maybe for some of us, it's also about control. I think that you can be thinking, I'd like to know all the boxes I need to tick in order to get to heaven. If I could just understand what the process is, what are the things I need to do, I can make sure I've done them all so that when I stand before God on my final day, I can be confident that I've done everything he's expected of me and that I'll be okay. Now, that's dangerous ground. It's dangerous ground for a couple of reasons. Firstly, it's dangerous ground because we're kidding ourselves if we think that we're going to tick every box and live a perfect life before God. But secondly, it's actually really not very honoring to God. Think about it. If we're saying, Jesus, I know that you died for me, that you shed your blood as a perfect sacrifice to cover every sin. But I'm just going to do a few extra things here and there just to make sure that I'm really covered because I'm not sure what you did was quite enough. How insulting to God is that? What he did was enough. And he wants us to live well, but not to earn it, not to add to what he did, but just because he wants us to want to. He wants us to allow the spirit in our hearts to provoke our conscience and enable us to live differently. When I first met my husband, who some of you will know, he had a different faith expression to me. And we were both Christians, but very different contexts. And it caused an awful lot of tension in the beginning. Uh, I would say they were debates. He might say they were arguments. I don't know. And uh, it was quite a rough time for us, actually. One of the reasons that we found it difficult was because Tom, my husband, his context was more rules-based. I think there's nuance to that, and he would probably give you more nuance to it. But from my perspective, that was what I could see, lots of focus on rules. And one of the examples of that was a conversation where he told me he doesn't eat meat on a Friday. Because in his context, they'd been taught that you should sacrifice something that you, you love, that you should sacrifice eating meat on a Friday in order to remember and honor the sacrifice of Jesus. That actually sounds lovely and really noble. But here's the thing. I asked him, well, what do you eat instead? And he said, I have fish and chips. And I was like, mm, but you like fish and chips. <laughs> you really like fish and chips. So it's not actually that much of a sacrifice. It's just a different treat. <laughs> And actually, that was a practice for a lot of people. They ate fish on a Friday instead. And I pointed out to him, hey, I know you love God. I knew you loved God. But that's just a rule that you're following. The heart in that, you might be intending to sacrifice to God, but actually, it's not sacrificial. God isn't interested in our gestures. He's not interested in the things that we do to take a box. He's interested in our hearts. And my husband is someone who really does love God and and he's a very humble man, and he, he changed that practice. He stopped giving up meat on a Friday because he realized it's unnecessary. It's not what God's looking at. The first time we ever went out for dinner, I'm honestly amazed that I even got another date because <laughs> we ended up in such a debate. 
we were chatting. I can't even remember what we were talking about, but I think I was telling him something about, I don't know, something I was struggling with with my faith, I think. Because I said the line, well, you know, I mean, I know I'm going to heaven, but I really wish I could sort such and such out. I really can't remember what it was. But Tom's reaction was, what? How can you say that? How do you know you're going to heaven? And I remember thinking, what? How do you not know you're going to heaven? <laughs> like, how are we having this conversation as Christians? And he explained to me that actually he'd been taught in his context that although he knew that Jesus died for him, actually practices and rules kept were going to make a difference. That on that final day, he wasn't sure if he could stand before God and be acceptable. And my heart broke for him, because this was a man that really loved God and knew the gospel, but he didn't know, he didn't have that assurance that he was accepted. God was never going to judge him on his behavior. He was always going to judge him on his spirit-filled heart and on the blood that his son had shed to cover everything that he'd done wrong. And I wonder for you, I wonder how confident you feel when you imagine standing before God on that final day. Do you feel like you'll be acceptable before him? Or do you think, I'm not sure if I've done enough? These verses about the law being written on our hearts are there to provoke us to understand that it's heart, not action. And we are entitled to have an assurance that we can stand before God. So I'm going to play you a short video clip. It's a guy called Don Carson, who I'm a big fan of. He's an incredible theologian and teacher. He's going to explain to us a little bit more about assurance because he's going to do it far better than I ever could. And then I'm going to ask Russ and Catherine to help us respond to what we've heard and explore this whole area of rules and acceptance before God and whether or not we can have assurance on that final day. Picture two Jews by the name of Smith and Brown, remarkably Jewish names. <laughs> the day before the first Passover, having a little discussion in the land of Goshen, and Smith says to Brown, boy, are you a little nervous about what's going to happen tonight? And Brown says, well, God told us what to do through his servant Moses. You don't have to be nervous. Haven't you slaughtered the, the lamb and daubed the two doorposts with blood, put blood on the lintel? Haven't you, you done that? You're all ready and packed to go? You're going to eat the, the whole Passover meal with your family? Well, of course I've done that. I'm not stupid. But it's still pretty scary. When you think of all the things that have happened around here recently, you know, flies and river turning to blood, and it's pretty awful. And, and, and now there's a threat of the firstborn being killed, you know? It's all right for you. You got three sons. I've only got one. And I love my Charlie, and, 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 and the angel of death is passing through tonight. You, you, you know? I, I know what, what God says, and I put the blood there, but... But it's pretty scary. I'll be glad when this night is over. And the other one responds, bring it on. I trust the promises of God. That night, the angel of death swept through the land. Which one lost his son? And the answer, of course, is neither. Because death doesn't pass over them on the ground of the intensity or the clarity of the faith exercised. But on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. That's what silences the accuser. The blood silences the accuser of the brothers as he accuses us before God. He silences our consciences when he accuses us directly. 
How many times do we writhe in agony asking if God can ever love us enough, if God can ever care for us enough after we've done such stupid, sinful, rebellious things, after being Christians for 40 years? What are you going to say? Well, you know, God, I, I tried hard, you know. I did, I did my best. It was, a, it was a bad moment. No, 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 no. I have no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb. There is the ground of all human assurance before God. There is the ground of our faith, not guaranteeing intensity of faith, so fickle are we. It's not the intensity of our faith, but the object of our faith that saves. They overcome him on the ground of the blood of the Lamb. Wow, that's great. Thank you, Irena. And um, what a great way to finish. Jesus has overcome by the blood that he shed for us. That's the grounds of our faith. That's how we can know assurance in him. I guess I want to start, as the band are just preparing, we're going to just go into another song. I just want to say, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior here today, if you are unsure of your future destiny, then today you can trust in Jesus, in the blood that he shed for your life by repenting of your sin and turning to follow him for the rest of your days. <laughs> That's called saving faith. And your faith is in Christ who did it for you. But maybe just as we sing, you're, you're responding to that sense of, which I just heard really quickly, is uh, are you insulting God by kind of adding to what he has already done? <laughs> and maybe that's for you to repent this morning and to allow and know God's full work over your life. <laughs> and there'll be others. Maybe you're here and you can very much relate to Tom, Arena's husband. And today, God wants to bring you into a fresh understanding of his grace. And he wants to fill your heart with his Holy Spirit and write that upon you rather than the old laws or the old covenant that you might still be tempted to live in. So why don't we stand? I believe God's going to minister if you're open to that through this song. So let's have open hearts to him. Let's allow him to minister to us as the band play. <laughs>